people have been on Zoom doing quizzes for weeks. People had seen bits and bobs from James Corden's thing from Anton Deck. And we wanted to make sure that actually, let's give people a bit of light entertainment with a shiny floor, high production values. When we were briefing the talent, we said, look, dress up smart. Look a little bit glam because actually people will want to see that because they just see people in their own, you know, their jumpers and their tracky bottoms at the moment. So um, we sort of had that, that opportunity to really go for it, which I think we took. Take us through the big night in. How long did you have and how many people? So the chronology of it was, so we'd done, we'd done Sport Relief, which I think was a huge advantage because Sport Relief was the 13th of March. And that week was the period where things were starting to get really tough. Lockdown happened on the 23rd. So we got in just under the wire. But during that week, there was lots of debates about, are we going to have an audience? Are we not going to have an audience? Are we going to have the event outside? Are we going to have presenters? You know, are we going to have a single presenter? So, and we completely rewrote the show on the Friday morning. Colin and I sat there and complete, with Richard and completely redid the show. So we were aware of how to work under changing conditions. Then we stopped we finished we got in just under the wire that weekend was the weekend that takeaway did their no audience show so it kind of gives you a context you know that was the blue chip entertainment show and they had no audience the following week lockdown happened and they did their um, pre-recorded and deck at home with lots of footage and it was around about that time that charlotte it all came from charlotte charlotte moore said she felt BBC needed to do something. Um, bearing in mind, the two charities are very different entities and they're actually, although it sounds strange in a charity context, rivals. You know, they don't operate together. I'd done Children in Need the year before, so there was, was a little bit of a bridge, but before that, they were very separate. Um, Charlotte wanted to do something. So she, the week of kind of, there was takeaway, um, done at home and then that weekend Corden did his thing in his garage and then the charities Charlotte was talking to the charities about whether they would work together and obviously they've got a lot of um, governance they've got big corporate sponsors who are rivals um, that they had to get on board and it, they, they all had to buy into their look we're all in it together and it's going to be a 50-50 split they said yes we were asked I was asked to kind of think about what we could do and then the show was actually commissioned the first week of April and the team we then had to I got Colin on board straight away <laughs> I found him and went help um, and then we started planning the team and then the team started on the 6th of April for a show that went out on the 23rd so effectively we had two weeks four days to make it but I'd had the week before to think about what we could do uh, and Colin got involved I think on the Thursday something yeah. like that so it was all pretty Constantina did and, and there was a slight gap there was a hesitation because they weren't sure we could do it you know with the charity commission and everything else get the two charities together um, and actually go for it so you know you, you've just done sports relief you've been up in the big studio in Manchester you've had the big crew there was already some experience of downscaling um, production for things like the one show what how did you know straight away that you were going to have to look at a different studio setup to the way that you'd done it before or did you you think right we'll approach this learning from others where, where did you start that thinking well i saw it was learning from others but it was i felt rightly or wrongly and it was a, it was a bit of a gamble i have to say that i thought the, the prevailing sensibility was entertainment you couldn't do it because you can't have an audience big studios look ridiculous um, you can't do live, all has to be done at home, people are locked down. And then we had three hours, we had three hours to do. And, and also there was a sense that, I kind of felt people were slightly chucking the towel in. There was a sense that it would all have to be clips. And the first conversations were, could you, could you do a show that had clips of the best of Comic Relief and the best of Children in Need? Um, and you know, let's run the peel lines off the back of that and see what happens. And I thought that was the wrong way to go. And we'd adjusted all the way through Sport Relief. And I thought we should try for something more ambitious. And I felt it had to be live, but not in people's homes, because I thought that was technically too much of a nightmare. So I wanted a studio. I felt it had to be multi-host, because that's what people are used to. And I you know, wanted a sense of the gang coming together. 
Um, and it had to be entertaining. And, and I didn't want to keep, I didn't want to do an archive show. I thought we could try and at least go for a, for new content. Because I thought, however we do it, you know, my attitude was, and Colin felt the same, we'll, we'll work our way through. That's what we've done on Sport Relief. We'll work our way through. We'll find out what the barriers, barriers are and then get around it. Um, and I felt the team, you know, we had confidence in our team rather than just settle at the start for what everybody else was doing or what everybody else was saying. Um, but it was a risk. Uh, and I laughed because Charlotte Moore fucked me up quite early on when I said, this is what we want to do, this is our vision. Um, and she said, you sure you can do this? Are you 100% <laughs> confident you can do this? Which does give you chest pains. Obviously, I was a bit like, I was 100% confident before that. And then I was a bit, no. Um, <laughs> But, but I was confident. I felt we've got to go for it. We've got to go for it because, you know, I thought somebody in their garage, like the James Corden show or people at home, it, it's diminishing returns. You know, it can get a bit, obviously not for this Zoom call, which is fascinating, but, you know, for a TV audience to sit and watch that for three hours, I didn't think it was going to work. And also just the comms, trying to get different hosts live to talk to, to, talk to each other. So straight away, we started looking for studios, which were all closing. And the only one that was around that we were very lucky was the one show. So we piggybacked off their expertise and their protocols and their health and safety. And I felt that was better than nothing. Mm. I felt that was better than, you know, again, it was like, that's all we had. So we went, right, let's, let's do the best we can within that confine. So well, I'm, I want to go back to that health and safety bit in a minute. But first of all, Colin, mm. so you're, you're putting together the team. I mean, yeah. did this affect the way that you put the team together? Presumably, you've got to put a huge amount of trust into everyone. Yeah, a, a, absolutely. And I think that was key, really. I mean, yeah, and I should say, actually, I think from the, from the point that Charlotte commissioned it and said, look, can you actually do it? First of all, we had incredible support from Kate Phillips, Katie Taylor, Susie, Charlotte. They all said, go and make it. Um, and Richard as well, Richard Curtis. So, yeah, obviously that put a lot of pressure onto us, but, you know, to have the support straight away just meant that we were very confident going forward. And I think um, the advantage we had of just doing Sport Relief is that everyone, I'd say 90% of the team, we inherited from, or we sort of took on, dragged over from Sport Relief onto the show. Um, and they were all match fit, for want of a better expression. They'd just come off doing a huge relief. We'd been under a lot of the same pressures and very you know fluctuating potential fluctuating running order and scripts because of the coronavirus and we sort of just said look you know do you want to come and join us for the next three weeks it's going to be long it's going to be hard but you know we need you and the, and the team um every one of them turned around within minutes and said yep yeah, i want you know we had to put this team together but i think we put it together in 36 hours or something like that everyone came back straight away and said yes i want to do this and i think that's the thing with these shows um you you weirdly have to have done one to know how to do one so i think you know in an ideal scenario we would have just gone straight away and just used brought people in uh from across the channel that were had you know been laid off or you know do, you know been taken off of productions because they weren't being commissioned anymore or what have you whereas actually in the only way i think that we could have got this to air i think a large reason as to why it was a success is because we were able to rely on people that had just done a relief and knew how to do it. And anyone that has worked on these shows before just know the complexities between uh, not just one, but two charities coming together, plus the channel, plus us, plus uh, the appeal teams, plus Richard Curtis. So there's lots of different moving parts. We just didn't have the time uh, to sort of, you know, normally sort of back in July, we'd be going, right, let's look at crewing the team. Let's bring in some new blood. Let's, you know, so um, we had to rely on the team, but luckily they were all sort of ready to go. Um, and we had to just very much say to people, right, on a nine o'clock Monday morning, similar to this with 30 odd people, right, these are the 20 things that need to be done within the next 24 hours. Uh, go away and do it. And we'd then spend 12, the next 12 hours on Zoom meetings. And then, you know, 24 hours later, we'd speak to the team in the morning and, you know, 99% of the time they'd brought home the bacon, as it were. So, Peter, this is one of the things I wanted to ask, you know, you've got you and Colin in the middle. How did you coordinate all of these people? Because no one's physically present. I mean, I'm assuming there was no actual office that you were in that, you know, you had to communicate every day with these people, but also you had to give them a great deal of freedom to produce their editorial content while still being across it. So how did you, did you have a process in mind about how you would communicate and bring the team together? 
Um, how rigid was it? And uh, how did you work with individual team members in order to ensure that all the information was shared amongst them? Um, we didn't have a bit, it was a suck it and see thing. I, mean, I think the key to the whole thing was trust all the way around. Um, you know, Kung touched on it, network were brilliant. And I think they trusted us because we'd already done Sport Relief just recently. BBC Studio, Susie Lamb, it really helps that she's a programme maker. And that thing that Colin mentioned about us being able to bring, the, Susie just said, what do you need? Just tell me what you need. And I think there was huge pressure for us to take people that were, had been laid off around the BBC. But I was, I'm sure many of them would have been brilliant. I was worried and Susie went into bat for us and, and helped us out. We got the team we wanted. So we knew we could trust them. And in terms of how it worked, it was literally a 9 a.m. for an hour and a half. The way it worked was an hour and a half where we went through everything, we built the content. And then in each area, we had a couple of brilliant producer directors. And this was right at the start. So nobody was making anything under lockdown. So nobody knew there hadn't been a, have I got news for you or a mass report yet. Nobody knew how to do it. And we have a, I have to say, a brilliant team under Claire Huggins of production, the production management side. Mm. And again, they're like ninjas. We just knew we could rely on them. I didn't know how you could edit remotely. But I kind of went, can you go off and find out, you know, how many VTs we're going to have to make? Can you just work out how we do it? Which they did. And then every morning we had this meeting where we went through everything, went through the content, you know, chased everything, divvied everything up. And people just had to work absolutely independently, which they did brilliantly. And then we all went off, did our thing, came back the next morning, did the same thing. And at this, while that was going on at 11 o'clock, I spoke to both charities and all the uh, fundraising and, you know, all the, all the corporates and everything else. So we did content first and then I did the charities and Colin focused on the content while I was doing that. Because obviously there's a lot of politics and bits and pieces involved. So and the other thing I'd say, the other thing I would say, which we haven't touched upon is at the start, it was quite a risk. It was quite a risk because we knew when, when, when Charlotte said she wanted to do it, she gave us two dates. She gave us the April date or one much later in May. And after the Corden thing, I thought we had to go quickly. Um, but we knew at that point, the TX date would be the height of the death rate from, um, uh, COVID, the the height of the impact of everybody was being laid off, and this was before furloughing of the financial bite, um, and we were a month after comic, uh, sport relief. So there was a danger. Tonally, it was really important to get right, and there was a danger we could alienate people. People could feel like, oh god, another appeal show. Um, why are they asking for more money? I've got enough problems. And our feeling was, which all fed into it being live, it had to be entertaining which is why we wanted new content we couldn't go for repeats uh it had to be the ask for money had to be more gentle than normal because everybody was in a new situation um and you know we just had to make it as special as possible and it kind of an inclusive night that was our aim but we were i was very nervous because we could have got it really badly wrong and it would have impacted on comic relief and children in need mm you know, down the line uh, going forward. I mean, it's easy now with hindsight to, to see how much people got behind it. But for the first 10 days, Colin and I talked about it a lot. It was a real issue. But the thing that drove me, I think, was there was an article in the Sunday Times just saying charity was facing Armageddon. The whole thing had fallen off the cliff because all the shops had shut, all the fundraising things were off. And we just felt we had to try and do something. Um, so we came up with this show and we thought, right, it's going to be, it's going to be the best we can make it in these situations. And we might go down in flames, but we had to give it a go, really. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the things I really want to ask you later on, but we'll bring it forward now, is so what did you learn from that? What did you learn about making these shows from that experience, from that reflecting that public feeling? Because clearly those shows run on a regular basis. They've become event, regular events within the schedule. You were doing something completely out of the ordinary, and as you, ordinary, and as you say, it could have gone wrong people could have felt very angry that you were asking for money at this time did you as you were asking people to get involved and as you were trying to create the editorial did you feel that um the public were behind you did you get any indication of that it's hard to tell it's hard to tell the corporates through the charities were certainly behind it and felt they were, i think there was a general feeling of helplessness people felt they wanted to do something but certainly in the first 
was going to say first week or so, first <laughs> half of it. Um, we didn't know. We didn't know. I just had a gut instinct that I think two things. I felt very strongly Brits are pretty good, even in times of absolute crisis, historically and now, of looking out for people who less well off than themselves. And I felt, you know, for all the problems, there was still a core. And if we could make our appeals to show precisely how, how the, um, how COVID was impacting on the charity, we would be in with a shot. That was the first thing I felt. The second thing I felt very strongly was that, and I think this is true of British production, actually, our team, we didn't know what it was going to be like, but it was going to be the best we could make by the time we hit air. And I felt our team could get past any issues that presented. And things changed, you know, the one show studio cut down half the number of people you're allowed in the studio halfway through our run. So we had to completely reorganize again. And there were almost every day there were issues coming up. Um, but we just had to go, right, how do we get past this? Well, Okay, and so I'm going to talk a bit more about the editorial in a minute. What I, at this point, and, and I'm, I'm aware that there are questions coming in, we're cool. going to try and do questions at the end, and some of these questions will be covered by some of the things that we're going to discuss. So again, towards the end, if you feel we haven't covered them, then please re-raise them. But um, on to, you, you've now got the go-ahead, you've got an editorial in mind, you feel you have a right spirit. Where did you go to for the first piece of advice about how to make this in the time of Corona? Given that every single day things were changing, you know, how, how were you going to get advice about how you could shoot the inserts, how you could shoot the studio? Were there people on hand at the BBC coming to you? Did you have to go and find them? Was it government advice? Where did you start on that process? Well, we, we were taking advice from BBC Health and Safety, who are following government guidelines and would always sort of daily update. Um, and I think because we did have the one show who had been, you know, putting their show together every day from that studio, we had a sort of, we had a starting point. So we were very, we were talking to their production on a daily basis. Or I say, I say we, Claire uh, and the production team were. Um, and they very much, in, ter in terms of uh, health and safety, in terms of the studio day, they were very much across it. And that was an evolving beast that was sort of changing daily as Peter said and in terms of in terms of the in terms of filming um we I mean I, if you want me to come on to this now Nick I, in terms of filming the content there well, was the, at this point is you know did they put a health and safety person into your team was it the production manager take you know yeah. some, somebody has to take a personal responsibility for a disparate team and that's quite hard because yeah. it's quite Someone to say, well, I'm going to come in and see so and so, or I'm going to meet with a contributor to brief them and potentially breach the rules. So, you know, was there somebody on that, your team who was that, that was all, yeah. So, so Claire, uh, um, the line producer, she, she, she was the conduit, to that. she fed all of our health and safety back through the team. So, she was sort of the, the touch point for that. And did the um, team have to, you know, did they have to complete forms to say they'd understood what they were doing? Were they getting regular written updates on how the rules were yes. changing and evolving? I'm very interested in that actual process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were, yeah. get, we were getting emails every single day about the, uh, the government guidelines. We all had to sign forms to say that we were um, uh, well and healthy and hadn't felt ill at all getting closer to production for us that were then going to go to studio that was on a sort of more regular basis because obviously you know things can change from, from day by day um but what i would say is that claire uh, and her team had to i mean we all had to learn very quickly as everyone has has had to i think across this period but on top of sort of dealing with putting together a show in two and a half weeks claire had to sort of deal with that whole side of things and learn you know all the sort of health and safety behind it as well so um you know thank god that we had claire really because and her team because they they made it easy for us it's one thing that we didn't really have to worry about in terms of you know they would provide us with the information and we'd deal with it as opposed to us then having to also go out and go right what do we need to do health and safety wise when we went to go and film something when we went to pl plan a shoot or go into the studio the information was always given to us well in advance um, and we were kind of kept shielded from that, which is great because it meant we could make the show. The other, the other thing I'd say is, again, it was a benefit of being, being with the BBC. This was the first week, so straight away, um, Susie, you know, the entertainment and music were doing other shows, so they were looking into stuff. The network were trying to make things like mass reports, so commissioners were very helpful. They'd say, oh, you know, we're going to try this. Um, 
we knew Electric Robin anyway, who kind of um, carved themselves out as the masters of remote filming um, and do things like the Mass Report and Have I Got News For You. So within that, that very first week of production, we had a good sense by the Friday of the different techniques we could use. Um, and then, and we needed to know by then because mm. we had to start filming, we only had two weeks. Yeah. Um, so we get into, you know, all the different ways you could make sketches. And just on that point, please, because I mean, one of the things you talked about was the fact that you brought together these huge charities that existed in their own right, but also the corporate partners. I don't think people necessarily understand how much corporate is involved. So from uh, uh, um, an editorial policy point of view, did you have somebody from editorial policy working on the team with you? Again, I'd have thought you weren't going to have a lot of chances to reshoot materials. So getting it right first time was important. Did they feed into your team or did you have regular communications with them? How did that work? given the complexities of charities on the BBC and corporate? I had hourly conversations with Natalie Christian, who was brilliant, it is brilliant, uh, and just picked a path. There was a sense, there was a sense that nothing else had been like this. And the first issue with the corporate is you, you know, Children in Need have ASDA as one of their major sponsors. Common Relief have Sainsbury's. So who are, let's face it, normally cutthroat rivals. And they're on ongoing relationships. So you have to make, we had to make sure everybody was looked after and treated the same and nobody got any benefits. But at the same time, we, we had to say to them that this is something different. It's a kind of one-off. We need everybody to come together. We need to put everything to one side. And typically again, within uh, the thank you films, I mean, we only had three hours, normally have six hours. So we had to squeeze in as many of those films as possible. And all the corporates want to thank you typically. And then there were new corporates coming on board. Um, but normally on a, on a show you do, well, on the thank you films, you, you reflect how that company has worked specifically for the campaign. But they only had two weeks. So they could have read it. I mean, some of the supermarkets did amazing things. They got stuff in the supermarkets and it was incredible. But the films editorially were slightly trickier because you were, to be honest, getting closer towards an advert sort of thing. So just I mean, it was all about clarity, they, what they were doing. Just for clarity, can you explain what you mean exactly by corporates and the range of corporates that are involved in the charities normally? So normally there's four or five major sponsors. You know, they range from, um, I said, supermarkets, banks, boots are involved with children in need. So big, big companies, um, TK Maxx with Common Relief. And what they do, they tend to, um, I mean, they advertise the, the campaigns and the, the charities as well. Same when you talk about planning, the charities spend all year planning their mm. nightly, their, their yearly show. So the corporates will get their staff engaged and they'll, you know, places like TK Maxx, you go in there on Comic Relief, they sell the t shirts and it's wall to wall. Um, and they donate huge amounts of money. British Airways is another one, you know, every time you get on a British Airways flight, they have a Comic Relief team. So these companies back the charity. Uh, the charities and use both their staff and their their customers to, to generate funds and it was okay and you know and, and they're thanked but we had to corral them all together and thank them all get them working get them donating and thank them in a three hour time frame and treat them all fairly because if any of them had been upset it would have been a major problem mm. and that. we couldn't uh, as you say we couldn't reshoot anything so everything had to be pre-done with Natalie. We had to be signed up with Natalie before we oh. filmed anything. So onto the filming, Colin. Do, yes. How do you approach, you know, you're working with a mixture of pop stars in their homes. You might have one set of equipment. People who are used to doing voiceovers, you might have a different set of equipment. People who will be filming on their iPhones or... Oh. How did you approach the location filming and how did you decide what resources to send to whom? So very quickly, and this is something going back to uh, our health and safety around filming and people's homes and interacting with people, we took advice from uh, the channel and was fed back via Claire and the production team. There were really, we offered talent four different ways of filming. And again, I must say that we spoke to um, one of the first people we spoke to were Electric Robin, who had, as Peter said, you know, have this experience of remote filming. So they, they were sort of able to, uh, get into bed with us on some of the filming but essentially the, there was four different ways and they range from um, uh, people filming uh, content on their own phones 
Um, and for example, the Vicar of Dibley sketch, the Doctor Who cast, the, the cast of EastEnders, Romesh, the stand-ups who did their bits uh, on the night, they were all filmed on their phone. But what we did, what was quite important, uh, having spoken to the edit, um, iPhone footage tends to take a huge amount of time to ingest and would cause a bit of a log jam in what was already, already going to be a very busy edit. So um, what we did, we sent them uh, details of an app called, I think it's Filmic Pro was the app, yeah. that we asked talent to download onto their phones, gave them instructions. It cost 14 or 15 pounds. We said we'd reimburse them, but they're all fine with that. Um, and that, that app basically allowed them to, uh, a, uh, it would it'd film in a, in a format that wasn't going to congest or congest the edit. Um, it meant that the resolution of what they filmed was higher than you'd normally get on your iPhone. So the quality was going to be a bit better. Um, and it also meant that the, uh, the footage was stored in the cloud as opposed to on people's phones. Because the worst thing in the world would be that Dawn French would be halfway through a brilliant take and her phone to run out of storage. So that immediately gave people um, confidence to be able to film themselves. It gave us confidence that we were going to get a really good quality and version of their phone. Um, uh, the other option was for us to send kits to people and then talk them through how to set it up um which uh we did for the likes of Catherine Tate and David Tennant and for uh, Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon and we'll come to Catherine Tate in more detail in, in a second uh the other option was for us to um take kits to people's homes um and then set it up for them and then leave and let them film themselves and then the final option was for us to uh, send a PD into people's house, houses and have them at a socially distant two metres, et cetera, et cetera. So, which we did with the likes of David Williams, for example. So he recorded his, we did a prize giveaway with David uh, and his half of the Little Britain sketch. That was all filmed uh, with a PD in his house. Whereas Matt Lucas for his um, baked potato performance and for his side of the sketch was filmed on his phone whilst the PD was directing him over Zoom, sat in his car outside on the laptop. So, so there's, you know, we gave people these four different ways, or four different options, um, and depending on who it was and their personal preference and their, their, I suppose, their health, they decided which one they wanted to go for. Um, so just want to hold on a second there. There's a couple of people have asked to confirm the name of the app that you used. Um, I believe it was Filmic Pro. Is that right, Peter? I'm just, yeah, yeah. Film, Filmic Pro. It's about 15 quid on the App Store. So I'm, I'm, we're going to talk a bit more about um, the uh, Catherine Tate sketch and um, David Tennant. Just, uh, you know, you've got two people shooting, presumably at different times. No idea. Or did, they, did you try and get people to coordinate around the same time so they could hear performance? How did you work? The com uh, comedy is a skill yeah. itself, and timing, as we know, is everything. <laughs> uh, depending who it was and depending on what the sketch was. So... I mean, weirdly, the, 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 the Little Britain sketch, which very much relied on, uh, you know, uh, a two-hander, was shot across two different days, um, which is quite remarkable now when you look back at it. Um, and I think that's because, you know, say David would allow people into his house. Uh, Matt ah. um, wasn't 100% confident of people coming in. I think, you know, he had, I think he suffered from asthma, perhaps, or something, you know, so he did, you know which is totally fine which we respected so um that was a case of filming i think matt's was filmed first and then playing david's matt's side of things whilst i filmed that sketch and that was there was you know probably seven hours worth of filming so it's a lot to get for that two and a half minutes uh whereas the likes of rob bryden and steve coogan and Catherine and david um they very much wanted to be able to see each other and hear each other so with the Catherine Tate sketch, what happened? So Electric Robin sent um, two laptops, each to David and to Catherine. Um, and on those laptops, they had uh, really um, good uh, cameras or webcams. Uh, and then they would then be monitoring and be able to speak to them uh, because they also sent them in earpieces and an audio device. So um, it meant that Catherine and David could speak to each other over this audio device, uh, of which I, I can't tell you the technical details behind that, I'm afraid. Um, they could see each other through Zoom and they're being recorded through their webcams. And those webcams were recording onto the hard drive of the laptops that were delivered and also would be streamed straight back to Electric Robin who were recording 
uh, as a backup. Um, and then also our PD would then jump into the Zoom and be able to direct both Catherine and David. So you had a system where it was almost like a sort of mini OB in a lot of senses. And I think there's a, um, we've got a still of uh, the, the, the PD just sent me a still of the laptops. So Colin, one of the things I'm noticing you're saying here, and I know it's true also with providing props to Matt and David, you're taking a lot of things into people's homes. Yes, so, so, this, so just to go back, so this is our James Sindel, our PD. So he, um, if, if you, can, you can see there, you can see the guys. He was basically on pressing his left space bar to speak to Catherine, his right space bar to speak to, to, speak to David. And they would then run the sketch uh, 15 times or so. And they kept on doing it and kept on doing it. And that was the beauty, I think, of having this equipment and having the audio capability for them to be able to speak to each other. As you'll see from the sketch as well, the timing, especially on this, was so important. Uh, because of the way that Catherine's character Lauren interjects with with David, um, yeah. So, so that was that was quite important for this, and that's why I think this sketch worked particularly well um, because of that. Um, and you know, we could probably couldn't have done it uh, any other way. Something in the beginning there about how you actually got equipment sterilised to take out and so Can I just start by saying as well, absolutely fantastic. I have laughed. I've obviously rewatched it several times. <laughs> and I've laughed and laughed and laughed every single time. I particularly like, are you a doctor? That made me laugh very much. Um, but so Peter, just talk a little bit more about um, how you then logistically, I know a lot of people who will be dealing with productions of their own and thinking, how can I get equipment out? How can I get equipment back? Um, did you, you know, were there a team responsible for sterilising stuff? Again, given that some of this will presumably you've got rushes and things like that to get in. Yeah, well, so on that one, first thing I'd say is that that was the perfect sketch for us in a way, or one of them, because that is that justified why we needed new content. And it was also, it was quite, you know, some of the subjects, it was very current and, you know, it was on, on the money really, but funny. So that sort of was brilliant. Once we got stuff like that in, was great in terms of the kit going in uh i could give you the answer uh but i'd be a fraud basically my role in that was to say to electric robin can you get it in safely uh can it be can it be safe uh, can it be compliant and they go yeah i think to be honest it was them but i think what they did because we had conversations at the beginning they sent so essentially david Tennant in his house he'd go to a separate room with his family We'd nominate the room we were going to film in. We uh, they send somebody in. I think they had the opportunity of wearing a full suit. Yeah, they did. Take people in in full suit, put the laptop down, swap everything, everything that they touched, so it was completely clean. Exit, and then David would come in, do his stuff. Exit. They would come back in again in the suit, swap it all down, gloves, everything, take it back outside. Uh, so by the time he got outside, it was safe again. And I think that. On that one, that was the process, but um, we were very lucky to have them because they were, they'd were they done it the, the first weekend of production. They'd done Mash Report. And they'd yeah. kind of, again, a bit like the One Show Studio, had worked out their protocols okay, that the BBC Health and Safety were happy with. I, I, I can see time is flying as I expected. So very quickly then, post-production on this, was it different to the way you'd had to work before with post-production? I mean, now you know, things are sent in and out remotely in a different way. But was this very, very different? What did you learn um, in terms of the way to do it? And what did you learn from it? Do you want to go, Colin? It was go on. You, you go, go on. <laughs> it had every, everybody was remote. <laughs> everybody was, was remote. So the editors, you know, we, we um, used the farm. Again, it was very much the production team that sorted all that, this out. From our point of view, it was all being done where it got really difficult, we had so many items, as you do on these shows, um, there are a lot of links flying back and forth, and a lot of stuff, we had to put more pressure on talent to, to do stuff earlier, because you had to get it in, get it edited, and as it got 48 hours out of studio, the, the content flying around and the recuts and everything, that was, the, that was the closest we got to toppling over. There were a couple of things that we just couldn't, and we had brilliant edit producers running it. So we were running it like normal, but everybody was doing it from their bedrooms. And it just meant the communication process was tougher. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, can't, I, also just, I asked you a bit about that earlier on with the communication. So at this point, how are you viewing, approving, turning around edits? 
when you've got all of these other calls coming in, you've got your daily, um, uh, you've got your daily Zoom calls, you've got your charity calls, you've got your corporate calls, yeah. and you've still got to be seeing things signing off. So, how did you yeah. communicate with the team? Nick, the the the, the honest answer is, uh, we probably worked about eighteen hours a day for three weeks. That's kind of that's. I mean, and that's the you, we couldn't have done it otherwise. And I think. I said before, you know, we would be, myself and Peter would be communicating like from seven o'clock in the morning until nine when we had our team meeting, then pretty much from nine, uh, sorry, from 10.30 through till six o'clock some days, we were on Zoom calls with various different people, whether it's with talent or whether it's with the, uh, the charities uh, or whoever. And then we'd start looking and signing off VTs sort of, you know, from five or 6 p.m. in the evening, sometimes to 11 and 12 o'clock. And then you'd, and then maybe at some, at some points at midnight, I go, oh, let's have a look and see, look at the 300 emails that I've had today that, you know, so it was just, it was just condensing everything in like, you know, the seven months into three weeks, you know, we, we had to, and that's everyone, you know, so the edits were running. I mean, God bless our edit, edit producer. You know, we'd quite often get emails at like, four in the morning where he's you know still doing stuff so people were going above and beyond hugely and i'm sure broke all sorts of health and safety protocol but we sort of okay. you know we we had to do it you know this was going to come to you later on but how the, 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 duty of care to the team yeah, um peter your duty of care to the team you've, you've got them all working they're doing it for a good cause so they want to do their very best you're asking a huge amount of them to work in uncertain ways and we all know changing the neural pathways learning the new ways of work is tiring enough in itself how, how did you, how did you A, take on the responsibility of looking after the team, but B, what could you do to make sure they were all right during this process? I think the only thing you can do is keep the, I think it helped they knew us. Um, you, you've got to keep the lines of communication open. But I think the most important thing, and I think it feeds into them knowing us, is you've got to lead. They knew that we would be working as long, if not longer, than they were in a way. Mm. So now that doesn't make it right, but at least it, we're not, the thing that used to drive me mad when I was in my twenties and in edit suites was somebody seeing me flouncing in at five o'clock, mullering my film, <laughs> giving me 15 hours of stuff to change by the following morning and flouncing out to go to dinner. Um, so I think you just have, that's how you lead. I think you have to look after people. You have to say to them, we were trying to push uh, breaks in and everything else. And I think we quite good at that we it was a voluntary thing but the the nice thing is and i think this is true in most of television people want to do you know people want to work hard and feel a great sense of pride in the program and mm. also i'm gonna sound like an 18th century mill owner here um there you know we didn't know when our next work was coming and we thought, thought this was all quite special so everybody really put their work you know their effort into it because they knew there was a, we had an absolute deadline absolute cut off and it's one of those things where you go, right, let's flog ourselves uh, and invite other people to flog themselves if they don't have to, <laughs> knowing that we had, a, we had an absolute deadline and then, then it would be finished. And, and, and just on that as well, I think that, you know, we, we made it, I mean, and, uh, I, you know, I'd like to think that we, it was fun. I think we, you know, we, I, we, there were certain stresses and there always are, but we, there was very much a, right, we as I think with the whole country, we were sort of, going through this we're all in this together and we've got the opportunity as a team here to make a bit of history and that you know we could do something here you know turn a show around in two and a half weeks that could raise a huge amount of money that could you know they could really it will make a difference and I think that I mean we always have that that's always our drive as as program makers of these sorts of shows I don't think you can do these shows as many as, as we've done without that but this was a real sort of right hold on guys you know if anyone's seen Escape to Victory, it's like half time at Escape to Victory. I was like, hold on, we can win this. You know, you sort of, um, I kind of felt like we were sort of riding that wave slightly as well. And it, it, I think everyone on the team was so positive and we were, we were always positive, no matter what's going on behind the scenes. And I think, you know, we just sort of kept that going. And, and also a certain amount of like, I'm not, people probably aren't expecting a lot from us. So actually, they're going to be quite surprised when they see this Catherine Tate sketch and they're going to be quite surprised when they see that, you know, Peter Kay's done it, Amarillo going, and, you know. So I think actually we were in a quite a good position because there hadn't been, as Peter said, there hadn't been this sort of show before. And we had an opportunity to go, look, 
it can be made. It can be made in a very short time. And it's something different. And at that point, what we were trying to make sure was that um, uh, we didn't just give people more of the same, you know, pe people were very used to seeing this. People have been on Zoom doing quizzes for weeks. People had seen bits and bobs from James Gordon's thing from Anton Deck. And we wanted to make sure that actually, let's give people a bit of light entertainment with a shiny floor, high production values. When we were briefing the talent, we said, look, dress up smart. Look a little bit glam because actually people will want to see that because they just see people in their, own, you know, their jumpers and their tracky bottoms at the moment. So um, we sort of had that, that opportunity to really go for it, which I think we took. Uh, right, you've had two and a half weeks, you've got everything together, you've got your films. Talk, talk to me about the studio. How did you approach the studio? You're going into a much smaller studio than you normally would, working yep. under different rules and regulations. So perhaps you could take us through, Colin, the plan and some sure. of the big differences in terms of actually doing this. Well, I, th I, think, I think, you know, one of the main differences in this sort of show is that we, we didn't have an audience. Um, you know, sort of, uh, and that was very different for us. And we, you know, we always make these shows with audiences because the talent tend to get the feedback from it. It creates atmosphere. So immediately that sort of set out a stall of what the show was, was going to be like. And had, when we first briefed uh, the presenters, we said, look, it's going to be very different. We're not quite sure how it's going to go, but really, you know, it's up to you guys to sort of bring some life to it. And, um, and actually, as, as it turned out, I think what it did do, it allowed them to concentrate on just doing their job, which, sound, which sounds slightly weird. But I think sometimes with shows with audiences and with, you know, lots of shtick built into it and items and, you know, acrobatics, as it were, I think sometimes there's so much going on that it's quite hard for them to concentrate on just looking down the barrel and asking people to give money. And I think it freed them up a little bit, weirdly. So it meant that they were all quite comfortable in, their, in, in what they were doing. And it all felt quite natural. Um, as a viewer, it, it did, sometimes these shows can feel a little overproduced, a little sure. overrehearsed, and it didn't. It felt very, very natural. I want yeah. to get a bit more of that with Peter in a minute. Sure. Colin, would you just take us, I want to understand physically mm. how you approach oh, sure. the studio. Well, for... Should we have a look at the studio floor plan? Um, so this is, this is like the first version of the studio plan. And basically what we wanted to do, when we were offered the one show studio... Um, there, Hello. Um, we basically, we, we said, look, what we don't want to do is try and sort of, you know, well, we couldn't because of budget and time, we couldn't totally reskin it. But what we did is we, we had some new graphics made up. We used the existing um, screens that were there. And I think we bought in one more plasma. Um, we we're always going to have three hosts. And uh, what we did quite early on was decide to have this floor print, the big night in. And what's very clever about that is that it was two meters in terms of width. So we knew that our social distancing for our presenters was always gonna be kept if they stood either side of that floor print. So it was there for an aesthetic, but also to do a job as well. Um, I think we had, so we had what, we had four cameras, we had three camera operators, or sorry, yeah, three camera operators and an assistant. I think we had a, a floor manager, but I think something that if anyone that's worked on a live show before on these sorts of shows, um, we would normally have probably two to three producers plus a please plus researchers on the studio floor that are briefing um, and helping us make the show but we didn't we, we couldn't just because of the social distancing and the amount of people in that studio so automatically that was that was the first thing that was very different um, we physically didn't meet or say hello in person to the talent on the day which again is odd because you'd normally spend the three days that we'd normally have rehearsing this sort of show doing that but we had a morning to rehearse it uh, and uh, the evening to, 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 to TX it live. And, and that's, it's, it's odd, but normally, yeah, normally you'd be in the dressing room, you'd be speaking to them all day, you'd be having script meetings in, in person, but we didn't see them at all. So it was quite strange. Um, and you felt slightly uh, exposed from it because, you know, you're kind of thinking, well, if something's going wrong, it's my job down their ear to sort of, do it whereas you know i could be briefing a producer whilst at the same time talking to also whilst at the same time talking to the director whilst at the same time trying to work out the time of the script supervisor so so it was a challenge but you know we just had to go for it it was actually worth saying the reason we couldn't talk to the presenters was we weren't allowed in the studio we yeah we had a maximum number of people in the studio we had a researcher standing outside the door but that was it we would have 
broken health and safety if, if any of us had gone in the studio. Yeah. So, so this, this was version one of a very basic uh, diagram of the gallery. Um, and originally, the script supervisor was going to be in the gallery with us. Um, but as discussions went on and as the goalposts with, in terms of health and safety guidelines changed, uh, it meant that we had to reduce five down to four. So the script supervisor had to go and sit in the corridor uh, alongside Peter, who was stationed in the corridor as well. So it meant there was myself, the auto script uh, operator, the vision mixer and the director in the gallery. So there's four of us in a gallery that would normally, I mean, if anyone's worked in the gallery before in a studio, there's normally about 15 people in and out there from, you know, commissioners to uh, the charity, et cetera, et cetera. So there's four of us. So it's very, very, uh, very sparse. And the uh, particular challenge, I think, one of the particular challenges I had on the day was um, because we had to hit the live clap at eight o'clock and then we had to hit the 10 o'clock news, um, the timings were so, we had to be spot on with our timings. And with these sorts of shows, timings fluctuate all the time. Um, and the talkback went down totally. So at points during VTs, I was having to run into the corridor to speak to the script supervisors to work out how much over we were to then run back into the gallery rewrite the link out of that VT with the also script to shorten it to make sure we then hit the next VT on time. And I think from about quarter past seven to the end of the show, every time we went to a VT, I was having to rewrite or we were having to remove things around. What we, what we didn't want to do was drop anything. And I think the only thing that we dropped across the whole show was a gift aid VT, which was actually a reversion repeat from Sport Relief. So we kept all of our new content we kept all of our links we kept all of our prize draw vts which raised around about i don't know over a million pound on the night um we kept all of our live links we kept everything that we wanted to and actually it was just because you know we were able to sub down the script as we went along but the, the host i must you know i must say they're all so brilliant and professional um as so so this is quite good so this is as we first arrived and that was as so that's Sophie on the right. She's our live producer, but she had to be, rather than being producing on the studio floor, she was in the VT room with the VT up. Um, there's our contingency producer. And as we go down, basically, that was the, our corridor, our script supervisors, and then the gallery was just around the right. But it was just quite an odd experience. Um, all the rooms had um, alcohol wipes. Uh, we all had sanitizer. Uh, we had, we, the canteen was open at MBH, so we had food that was um, delivered to us. Um, so everything ran as it would do normally. It just, it was just a very sort of sparse environment. And we had to, you know, a lot, lots of times we just had to make calls that maybe you would sort of refer up or, you know, to other people. You, you just had to make your calls there and then. It's quite refreshing. And what about comms for the team there? How did you work with, you know, how did you communicate to these people given that they would traditionally be in one space and able to actually yeah. see them here? Well, so we, we would talk on talkback, we'd, we'd have, uh, so I'd have comms to all the hosts um, and then also have comms to the script supervisors uh, and then also be able to speak. I think me, myself and Peter just sort of ran out of the room and spoke to each other. Um, uh, and then also, so Richard Curtis was uh, based, uh, he was in his home and he had comms through to us as well. Um, so, it, and which was all perfectly fine until the comms went down. And then that became quite a challenge because, you know, you're sort of riding solo then um, and sort of, you know, legging it around course, the place. It's also worth saying that that gallery is below the newsroom you see uh where the bbc do their news that famous <coughs> newsroom which is a floor down in any way so this is two floors underground so we were in here which was very much a bunker mm. and the, everybody else was on the seventh floor spread around um broadcasting new broadcasting yeah. house so yeah. we didn't see any of those either all no. the uh, uh, Claire. Uh, so uh, Pete, uh, maybe if i can come to you then to talk to that how did you make your talent decisions how did you talk to the talent beforehand? How did you brief them? How did you deal with things like wardrobe, makeup? How did you deal with physically getting them to the studio and getting them back? You know, again, in these times, it's all different. So maybe you could just take us through the processes involved and how that worked. So the hosts, uh, I mean, Lenny summed up, he said at the beginning, I'll never forget it, which was a picture art, which was an ad lib. He said, I think he said, 
anything could happen or nothing could happen. And that was sort of slightly our mantra going in. My reference was The Big Breakfast, because everybody was saying, you can't do it without an audience. And I felt, I'm old enough to remember that, I was like, well, no, that was always funny. And if it is just, you make the camera man laugh, that's fine, we'll live with that. People understand what's going on. So we were very clear with the host. You know, we said, if anything goes wrong, make a joke of it, go with it. You know, it's a bit student telly, the way it's being done. Let's embrace that rather than get very uptight about it. So the beauty of it is, obviously, they were all um, brilliantly professional, and that didn't faze them. So they were all, you know, the ring craft in the studio was second to none. So they were all quite calm about it, which gave us reassurance because we knew if anything went wrong, they would just go with it. And I just said, you know, make fun of it. If, if anything happens, make fun of it. And they were, again, very much, they really wanted to get involved. They really wanted mm. to do stuff. Um, and the one, the one person I, I think is worth mentioning is Paddy. And Paddy hadn't left his house at all from lockdown because he's got three quite vulnerable um, children. And it was a big deal for him. And at points, we weren't sure whether he would do it because, you know, he, there was a very real risk for him. And in the end, which, again, we had to go through health and safety loops, he... Uh, drove down from Manchester on the day, did his bits and pieces, did his rehearsal, uh, sat in his car in the underground car park, got changed in his car, put his makeup on his car. They all put, their, you know, they all had to look after themselves. Came out, did the show, um, finished the show, drove back to Manchester that night to be back with his kids, which is pretty remarkable um, considering. I mean, it's a long day as well, but he was so determined to do it. But at the same time, he was very worried about the the possible, you know, and at the time London was the height of infection and he's coming down from Manchester and I know his wife was very, very worried, understandably, but he was determined to do it. And I think that kind of spirit got us through. And then he was slightly pioneering as well. They were a bit like, it was like going back to the start of telly, so who knows? You know, we had all these live links, which think about was a mad thing to do. <laughs> yeah. They could have gone down at any point, but they, they worked, thank goodness. But, um, that was the mantra of just like let's go with it see what happens we don't know yeah and i, I no think idea what any of it. I, I think just to add to that as well i think one of the uh one of the great one of the pros i think was that historically if you tried to get five or six hosts together for script meetings for any sort of meeting before the night <clears throat> nearly impossible because their diaries are so busy and they're around the country and but actually having Zoom meant that we had probably more interaction with the host before the night than we would have done on a regular show. So um, I suppose that was one, one benefit from it. Uh, but also in terms of the tone, just going back to the tone of the show, one thing that we sort of set out very early on is that um, uh, we, the tone had to be spot on. And in that, we had to make sure, I think, that we weren't overly, what's the word? I think we had to make sure that we had to entertain people. I think people were at a point where they wanted to laugh and they wanted to be cheered up. And I think, you know, looking at the Catherine Tate sketch and Little Britain, you know, some sketches that was slight, you know, slightly on the edge in part, but, you know, that opening link where Matt Baker said, oh, I'd like what you've done with the place, where's Pudsey? And then he says, oh, he's been furloughed. And we talked about that lots in our script reads. But actually, I think people needed just to have a little bit of a laugh. And then that would lead you into the films where people go, okay, look, this is why you need to give your money. I think that that's what, what helped is that we didn't dumb, I don't think we dumbed down uh, uh, the, the level of comedy um, because of the situation. I think people just wanted to have a good time as well. So as that well. brings me very neatly then to say, Peter, one bit that you know you could risk dumbing down, one piece of interesting talent for you to use was His Royal Highness the Duke of Cambridge, William. So <laughs> how did that happen? How did that feel? And how did you persuade him to make gags about taking his trousers off? Or, you know, and how did it come together? The only signs it was his idea. We we spoke to him myself and Tommy Nagra, who um, looks after Jim and Need, had a phone call with him on Good Friday about doing a message. Originally, we would do a message, and he came back saying, in that conversation, could you could could he do something else? Could he do a sketch? And my first response, if you want me to be absolutely honest, was God no, because again, it was very early days and tone. I was really worried about, and I had. Um, it's a raw knockout at the front of my mind. And I just thought, we cannot <laughs> do that. And I thought, totally, that'd be completely wrong. 
And again, to their credit, they went, no, 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 no. Think of the Queen and James Bond for the Olympics. Is there something like that we could do that's a bit more imaginative? So that got me thinking of that night. And I, I thought about it for about an hour. And I thought the reason that worked was because it had a purpose. The sketch almost was irrelevant. You were building to a purpose, which was the Queen opening the Olympics. Um, and that, and that, that gave you, and obviously I had James Bond in it, that gave you the value of the, the sketch. So I thought the clap, that was the thing. I thought, you know, that you need something meaty that justifies whatever you're doing. So I thought we've got to get the family in the clap and the sketch has got to lead to the clap. Pardon the expression. So that's, that night I wrote three versions all ending in, in him on his doorstep with the family. And that was sort of my, then we have all the family, please. It was a weird negotiation. And he, to his credit, got that straight away. And then we started, Richard got involved, which is a great help. You know, you've got Richard Curtis advising and, and uh, improving the script, that helps. Um, and it went, it went on and, you know, it was a long conversation. We did lots of versions because he had to be very careful. He, totally, he couldn't get it. So went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And he was suggesting stuff. He was writing lines. Um, God bless him. So, so it, but he was touch and go because we didn't know whether, you know, there's all the royal family you've got to get through. Um, and they had to be signed off by everybody, essentially. And then we, once we filmed that on the Monday. And once we got that, that was, I was, that was sort of the best day. And that was the day I thought, right, this is going to be something special. Um, you know, and there were a lot of security concerns about it because we wanted to show him on his doorstep and all that sort of stuff. But he pushed it through. Uh, and his team who were brilliant. And they pushed it through and they, they, they could see the value of doing it and they wanted to do it. Um, and the kids came, you know, God bless Charlotte, she was clapping before she even came out the door. Um, and we did it. We filmed it all safely. There was a cameraman in the bushes for positive reasons for once. And they knew, and we did it all on Zoom. And, you know, the, again, that was another thing with Stephen Fry, which was the rest of that sketch. We kind of begged Stephen to let us go into his house to film because I didn't want it all on Zoom because I thought it would look a bit... I wanted some production on the front of the sketch. And Stephen agreed to let us in and, you know, listen to my explanation. So what, the way it worked was we filmed that in the morning. We then filmed uh, Duke of Cambridge in the afternoon with the same PD who'd done Stephen sitting in a lay by near Norwich, I think it was near Sandringham, uh, directing and Richard Curtis on a Zoom call with the Prince directing as well or advising. So that was kind of incredible. When we got that in, you just thought, I oh, know that's great. But then it was interesting because editorially we faced a tough decision. We wanted to put it at the start. You know, you want to almost start with that, but it was to do with the clap. So and he very much wanted it. To, to go where it should have gone. But from our point of view, it was like, yeah, but there's a danger that everybody's out on their doorsteps clapping and they're not even gonna see it. So we said, oh, can we trail it, can we trail it? And he just went, no, I don't wanna, you know, uh, I just want it to be there. I don't want you to do a big kind of promo, which again was reasonable. So we're in this slightly strange position. We had to keep making these uh, comments about something very special is coming. Um, and that, I mean, interestingly, if you look back at the uh, the viewing that was the piece mm. watched it and then literally went out to their doorsteps mm. which was quite nice but no it was it was um it was incredible but very much inspired by and driven by him and his team so time is working against us as i expected i just want to go to, to come to the end by asking both of you i'm going to start with colin i want you to answer three questions for me oh God. number one what is your what is the best memory for you what are you most proud of the night Number two, what did you learn about, um, sorry, number two, what, if you could do something differently, what would you do? And number three, what did you learn from having to make this kind of TV in these kind of circumstances at this time? So starting off with your okay. favorite. Uh, I've got lots and lots of different, uh, uh, I think the whole, th whole thing, you know, I look back very fondly on it. I think there's two things really, uh, I think sort of getting, uh, bringing back, uh, David and Matt's Little Britain. I think that was um, in itself was 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 a, a big deal to do, and to do it the way we did it. Um, I think also having uh, Peter Kay emailing me and sending me footage and sort of uh, 
uh, giving me notes and things was quite special. And actually, uh, just going back to the communication on the day, what happened was in the studio, unfortunately, lots of people would email us. But because we were doing 30 things at once, uh, we didn't necessarily see the emails till later on. And actually, the day after the show, I woke up and checked my, my junk uh, box and my email. And I had four emails from Peter K giving me notes about the sketch, which we never incorporated <laughs> because I didn't see them. So, um, but no, I, I, th I think those, the, those are sort of, yeah, the sort of two special moments, I think, for me. Okay. And the one, so just give me one thing that you've learned from doing this. What, what is it you've learned? I, I, I think I've learned uh, probably uh, that any, anything is possible, really, in TV. I, I think I really think this was the biggest challenge that I have ever had uh, in live TV by a million miles. And actually bringing everyone together, uh, bring, bring, bringing the team together. But when I say team, I mean, you know, the, the Comic Relief are absolutely incredible. Children Need are incredible. The BBC are incredible. The editorial staff, the crew, everyone came together. It's like the Avengers assembly. Uh, but anything, anything's possible. And I think, unfortunately, people, you know, commissioners might now look and go, oh, you can do that, go and do it again. We can't. Yeah. <laughs> so, fantastic. Peter, Peter, your favourite moment and what is the thing that you've learned? Again, like Colin, lots of favourite moments. I think, the, I think when, when Peter Kay, who was the first person to offer his services, when we got the message to say Peter wants to do something, that was a real line. Mm. I mean, that was a right at the start. We just all sat up and went, oh my God. Uh, I think that Monday when we did the Royal Sketch and a few others and Catherine Tate was coming in and Little Britain was coming in, that was the Monday before Thursday. That was a big deal um weirdly my it was sort of lovely it was like it was lovely when it was done and i i walked back and what was quite sweet was on the post office tower top of the post office tower so we'd finished it was a bit of a weird ending because you don't have the normal drinks and everything else everybody just dissipated walked off and it was you know going around sort of thanks to everybody and that was actually quite sweet for me personally in terms of what i've learned a bit like colin it's like you can you can do anything you know set up set a high bar and as long as you've got the right team around you by around you i mean above you with the top cover alongside you and beneath you in the hierarchy if those people are right we can, you know you can do anything and it, it, i thought it was really impactful and that sounded too pompous it was a time when everybody was going oh you know we're gonna have six months of uh, archive shows and links from people's homes and I just like no we can do you can do a live show um, and I'm you know it was great the way it turned out it, it was great the way it turned out it raised a huge amount of money but I just thought from a TV production point of view it proved that we can do it you can do it and you, and you certainly did so I I want to say finish off by saying thank you to both of you I have so enjoyed talking to you not just this time, but when we were planning it. And one of the things people should not lose sight of, it raised £67 million, which is more than the last comic relief and more, last, more than the last um, Children in Need. So, you know, it was a tremendously successful event. You, together as a team, have done a really amazing thing and to work under such different and difficult circumstances. But um, for today... Really thing, just to say, that's up to 72 now. That's right. 72 million. <laughs> Money's actually gone out. And the only other thing I throw in is... It's also the greenest entertainment show ever made, apparently, we've been told. <laughs> but normally it's sort of, I think, 16 tonnes of CO2 an hour on an entertainment show, and it was 0.8, I think. So again, you know, I do think there's positives to learn about make, from making stuff yeah. that way. Yeah. And it will definitely impact, I think, going forward, shows that, you know, we make in the future with this, the huge learnings from this. So, yeah, it's been, it's been very positive. I think we've, yeah, we've got a lot of um, thanks coming in. I don't know if you can see the comments coming up, but there's an awful lot of people saying thank you. So um, oh, thank you very much, everybody. I think a really great session and, um, you know, extraordinary subjects we've covered and amazing achievements. So thank you.